Um, welcome to our virtual program. I am Liz Goodrich, part of the Deschutes Public Library's programming team. And um, during these crazy COVID times, we've been working really hard to keep engagement up with our um, library customers. And we do that by recording these kinds of programs uh, and making them available on our YouTube channel. So if you are ever looking for something to do, uh, to learn something new, please check out Deschutes Public Library's YouTube, to YouTube channel. There's all kinds of great stuff, cooking classes, history programs, um, pickleball tutorials, a program about Bigfoot that's currently got like 45,000 views. Bigfoot's popular. Um, anyway, we're really pleased that you're here tonight. Uh, I want to introduce our ASL interpreter. This is uh, Ray Morton, and she's been um, a real great partner with us uh, recording ASL <laughs> programs. Um, and I would also like to introduce tonight's presenter. This is Murray Godfrey. He is a history professor at Central Oregon Community College where he's worked since 2012. He received a master's of arts degree in history from Texas State University specializing in the history of 17th and 18th century North America. Prior to coming to Central Oregon, he previously taught at Austin Community College in Austin, Texas, and Alamo Community College District in San Antonio, Texas. And Murray's been a great partner um, over the years. I can't remember how long ago we um, started having you come in and do- 2015. Oh, so wow. I have, okay. my, I have my old presentations, so. <laughs> awesome. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Murray now. Just FYI, you can use if you have technical difficulties. You can put those questions in the chat, and I will get those and try to help you. Um, if you have a question for Murray, put those in the Q&A, and we will be answering all Q&A questions um, at the end of the presentation. So why don't you go ahead and share your screen? Okay. So I want to thank everybody for, uh, for attending. So this will be kind of a a brief overview of slavery's development and kind of the origins of, of the American version of slavery, the, the North American version, meaning the, that part of the Atlantic world economy that uh, involved the traffic in people. So, uh, and then how that uh, related to, uh, related to racism as it developed in the North American context. So uh, this comes from, variety of sources, including kind of what I've taught for, for a number of years. It's, there's been a lot of interesting developments in this, uh, in this field recently. And I'll, I'll touch on a couple of them. So slavery as an institution or as an idea existed almost as long as human civilization uh, existed uh, going back thousands of years. But there are a couple differences that occurred in the early modern period as uh, the world became more capitalist. And so the origins of the kind of slavery that uh, impacted the Americas started in the 1400s. And the impetus for this was uh, the attempt to increase trade routes and uh, for Europeans and to uh, get around the lock on trade that the Ottoman Empire had in particular in the 15th century, which uh, this map doesn't show up. The Ottoman Empire was based out of Turkey here and controlled much of the Mediterranean trade. And so goods uh, were very expensive for, for Europeans. And they were trying to figure out a way to get them cheaper and their traders were trying to figure out a way to make money and uh, what they discovered in the 1400s, in part because of the patronage of one of the princes of Portugal, a guy named Henry the Navigator, this is his nickname was the Navigator because he was a patron of geographic exploration uh, among, his, among Portuguese mariners. Uh, it gave them a lot of money to explore outwards, more than most other Europeans were doing at the time, or the European nobility. Uh, what these traders started doing was 
pushing further and further south along the African coast in the 1400s. And what they discovered was, uh, well, they already knew what the, the kingdoms that were there. There were kingdoms that had been powerful since the Middle Ages in different parts of Africa. And those kingdoms engaged in kind of a quasi-slave trade, uh, kind of the rudimentary early versions of what we'd come to know as the Atlantic slave trade, going in between uh, different parts of Africa and to and from Egypt and the Middle East and, and, and so forth. This older world slavery worked different than what we think of as newer world slavery. And it was because of the lack of capitalist uh, input. And that was what the Europeans really brought to the table was more of an entrepreneurial mindset to it. So old world slavery going back to ancient, the ancient world times uh, tended not to be based on race. Uh, slaves came from wherever you could get them. The word slave comes from the word Slav. Uh, and so Eastern Europe, Eastern Europe used to be a, a source of slaves. So where you got slaves happened to be wherever you conquered, usually. Wherever a, rich, a richer and more powerful country conquered, a poorer and uh, less powerful group of people, ethnicity, whatever. So slavery was not racialized as much. It was also not quite as uh, all-encompassing. So the big difference that we see starting in the 1400s and continuing through 15, 16, 17, 1800s was the all-encompassing, uh, lack of a better term, life change that, that slavery would, uh, that, that Atlantic world slavery did to people. Old world slavery, in a lot of ways, wouldn't look terribly different from different types of servitude and different types of uh, peonage or uh, peasantry. So the idea that their labor was unfree, that was a, uh, a pretty common idea throughout the world in, in the early modern period. Uh, there were different ways to exit slavery. Uh, if you, if your people uh, were slaves, it wasn't a guarantee that their your future generations would be slaves. It happened. In, it would depend on who defeated whom uh, in in wars or uh, what kind of societal changes happened over time, and. Uh, the different kinds of working classes, a lot of times the work wouldn't seem that different between the slaves and the poorest classes in, in various parts of uh, the world. Europe had moved away from using slavery per se for about three, 400 years. And uh, they, they had moved towards the manorial system and, and a different kind of economy that used various types of peasantry. And, uh, there were similarities between that and slavery. So the idea that you would purchase people for unfree labor, that was not outside the realm of, of uh, conceivability, outside the realm of, of uh, thought for, for Europeans at this time. So there was already an African slave trade going on. Uh, and what the Portuguese discovered is that one of the more lucrative products that they could trade in was slaves. And uh, one of the, as, as this, this quote shows, one of the earliest traders that uh, Henry the Navigator sponsored uh, said, you know, how, how fair a thing it would be uh, to come to this land for a cargo of such petty merchandise were to we're to meet with the good luck to bring the first captives before the face of our prince. And so the, what they were searching for were goods that they could buy low and sell high. And uh, slaves were one of those goods. And they, they were proud of having found this market. And this was just one of the many things they thought that they could uh, acquire from the various African kingdoms. Most of these African kingdoms were more powerful than Portugal. Portugal was a small country. Uh, 
And it uh, didn't have that many people. That was the reason why it was looking to the sea to develop its economics, because it didn't have enough labor in its country to really grow its economy all that well. And uh, it made relationships with uh, various coastal peoples on the coast of Africa. Uh, they typically, the, the most popular way to ingratiate themselves with coastal African peoples was to trade weapons with them. And in return for weapons, the... Uh, the, the coastal peoples would trade in all kinds of goods. The most valuable ones were uh, precious metals like gold, uh, things like ivory, and uh, slaves was one of the the more uh, valuable commodities. But there were various agricultural goods, uh, fabrics, and, and so forth uh, that that the Africans traded in that the Portuguese wanted. So they developed. The Portuguese discovered very quickly they could not colonize Africa. They would die like crazy if they did that uh, because of uh, the, their they were unused to the various uh, pathogens and everything that existed there. So uh, they did try to create a couple colonies and uh, they failed badly where they did uh, have some success. And then the Spanish after them were in some of these Atlantic islands, like Madeira and Canary islands where they discovered native peoples and kind of what happened to native Americans, in the new world. It happened first in these places. Uh, they had basically, gave them a choice of, hey, start working for us or face the consequences and then disease hit them. And those uh, natives on those islands were depopulated very quickly. Uh, and then they started looking for labor from elsewhere. And what they developed on those islands successfully were sugar plantations. So uh, the, the Portuguese kind of set the stage for European entrepreneurial activity with regard to the slave trade in the 1400s. But it was still a, a relatively small player compared to what the Africans were already trading with, with uh, the, the, the Mamluk uh, Empire here in, in different parts of the Middle East and, and, and so forth. The, the trade took some time to develop. The Portuguese developed it over the better part of a century and a half after that. So still 1400s, 1500s, still relatively small scale uh, trading networks, but they grew bigger and bigger. And uh, there were incentives to do more and more over time. But we think of the Europeans as kind of going in and having these uh, and capturing slaves themselves. They did not. Uh, generally speaking, sometimes the, there would be certain European soldiers of fortune that would engage in the, the actual capture of uh, slaves but, or, or of people to be slaves, but not too often. Those, those, uh, it was dangerous and they didn't know the territory. They, they would usually pay uh, locals to do that for them. And they, they did so uh, in, in exchange for all kinds of goods. So over the next century and a half, when the New World was discovered, uh, it opened up an enormous amount of opportunity for the Europeans to grow uh, their economies. The, the opportunity they had been looking for for the past couple hundred years to try to get access to the Asian markets um, and get the goods there less expensively and uh, be able to trade with that and trade with those and do an end round of the Ottoman Empire here, the, the gray uh, who that dominated Mediterranean trade. So Spain and Por Portugal had developed these African outposts uh, by the 1500s and Spain had been the first to have a successful expedition, uh, the Columbus expedition in the 1490s, make it to the New World and back and uh, start developing uh, what we call a colonial empire. And this is something I want to stress, something I always tell my students. When you look at these maps, the maps are colonized. So uh, and this is really bad and something the textbooks really need to get their minds around. You see this, this green color here that shows what the Spanish New World Empire was in 1550. That is not everything they controlled. Uh, they had some control here in Central Mexico. They had some control here in Peru. They had some outposts in Central America. Where they had more complete control was in the Caribbean islands. That was where they had successfully depopulated most of the natives. Uh, or unsuccessfully, if you want to put it that way, since it was uh, 
not necessarily good for them to not have any workforce. Uh, and they natives were in most control of this. The Europeans, it took them hundreds of years to really establish what we would consider those countries uh, where they had sovereign control over the whole area that's colored in. It took a long time for the native populations to, for the power dynamics to shift. And so when we look at maps like this here that shows, oh, the Spanish settlements, all the red, this is not what they actually controlled. They, they would color it in on the map just like we do and say they controlled it. They did not. But in some of these smaller islands, they did. So uh, what became the most lucrative product out of this new world uh, discovery after precious metals, which is what they originally hoped to find, and they found some, but then depleted that, uh, and inflated their own economies in the process. What became successful for them was sugar. And sugar was highly labor intensive. Uh, Spain and Portugal did not have the population to man these sugar plantations. Uh, they, they, could, they didn't even have the population to man the sugar plantations in the Canary or Madeira Islands, much less, much larger uh, islands like, like Hispaniola. So uh, they needed labor. Uh, and, and they would get it from wherever they could. The, the initial thought was to use the natives as labor. And the Spanish uh, sent over, and another thing we have to remember about these, uh, the establishment of these colonies is who the Europeans sent were not diplomats. Uh, they were not um, scientists. They were not philosophers. Uh, they were mostly soldiers. They were people who were either former soldiers, veterans of various wars, that were fought brutally back in Europe or in, or in the Mediterranean, or they were uh, soldiers of fortune who were basically pirates and people looking to get rich quick. So, uh, I mean, Columbus was, was one of them. I mean, he was someone who went on a veteran of the, the Portuguese expeditions along the coast of Africa, um, had gotten a charter from the King and Queen of Spain, to uh, uh, try to establish a trade route to Asia. And uh, his goal was to make money as quickly as possible. And so, so the way they thought they would do it first was, well, let's, let's put the natives to work. And the, the thinking when Europeans first met the natives is that they were quote unquote savage and quote unquote heathen. And that's, that's something we'll come back to in, in that the Europeans were not racist as we think about it in this initial period. That how we define racism today is not what they were. They defined their sense of hierarchy based mostly on religion. So, uh, and on their perception of what religion was. When they encountered the natives, what they saw were people who to their eyes, did not have a religion and at best had some kind of devil worship. And so they thought these, according to the Bible, we can enslave people like this. And so it, it was thought that they were first simple people that would gladly be enslaved. And, and then when they just didn't acquiesce to the kind of labor that the Europeans didn't wanted the natives to do, uh, they would fight back, and then the uh, colonizers would try to force a, uh, forcibly uh, put them to work on, in, in their colony, colonial plantations, uh, growing sugar, and uh, when if they would die in that process of either war and or overwork, uh, they, they started importing labor from wherever they could get it. And the Europeans had, had done this to themselves. Uh, the process of conquering and uh, taking over one one place or another in, in their various wars. Uh, the, 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 the process of being brutal towards others, I mean, they had just gotten through things like the uh, Inquisition. And so the process of torture to make someone do something you don't want or they don't want to do 
that was not new to them. And again, these are soldiers who had just been through religious wars with uh, the Moors, uh, Muslims from, from Northern Africa and Southern mm-hmm. Spain. So, so they, they were used to fighting these brutal conflicts and then dominating the, the people they conquered. And they, they considered it no different in, in the New World, and they considered it their right. Uh, over time, Spain overextended itself. Uh, and began to lose control of all of the, the colonies that it initially tried to establish, and uh, different Europeans competed with them, French, uh, Portuguese, Dutch, English, and, and so forth. Again, the most profitable crop was sugar. And it, it, after they, they depleted whatever the native products were, the goal was to create what they called a plantation. And this, this came from the, the name plantation comes from the English term that they used when they were colonizing Ireland. Uh, idea is you basically place a new set of leaders over uh, conquered peoples and those conquered peoples become your serfs, your servants. Uh, and those conquered peoples are somehow lower than you in, in whatever way uh, was most convenient. But usually that way, the, the, that means of condescension had to do with religion. They were not Catholic enough if you were Spanish or not Protestant enough if you, if uh, when, once the Protestant revolution happened, that would be the justification for forcing these people to work. And Africa increasingly, because of those uh, trade outposts that had been established became an increasing the source of labor for these Caribbean plantations that were producing a very lucrative product, sugar. Uh, the most lucrative products that came out of it were obviously the, the refined sugar that you use in your food. Uh, it was also used to preserve various, fruit, various foods back in Europe. And then the raw material that you used from heating up the cane could be made into rum, uh, which sold very well, and, and various other products. So those were the most lucrative products they could sell. And sugar destroyed workers because of the heat involved. Uh, the, it, during the harvest season, it requires sometimes like 16, 18 hour days to harvest it at the right time, given the technology of the time. And uh, it would just uh, burn through workers. And the chance of a sugar worker surviving more than three years was pretty low. Uh, the average slave uh, put to work on a sugar plantation lasted uh, less than three years. So uh, you needed constant uh, replenishment of those workers and that had to come from somewhere. To put it in uh, the words of historian Eric Williams, The planters, quote, would have gone to the moon if necessary for labor. Africa was nearer than the moon, nearer to than the more populous countries of India and China. So they had a labor shortage. They needed labor. This was a way to get it. Uh, there were people providing it, and they were going to grow this system. And the, the capitalist input by the 17th and 18th centuries just got more and more intense, and it produced more sugar, produced more product, produced more everything. And to do all that, uh, to take advantage of all that growth, you needed more labor. You're not going to do it otherwise. The English saw all that going on from the 1490s to the, or from the 1400s to the 1600s, and they wanted in on that too. But the English had a sense of su- their own nationalist superiority. They thought they were a lot better than the Spanish. Uh, the English and Spanish had been rivals for a long time, and the English thought they were fundamentally better people, especially after their. Um, their Reformation, Protestant Reformation that had happened in the 1500s. They were especially suspicious and, uh, and, 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 and with a strong self, self-righteousness over the, the Spanish Catholics, the Papists, as they called them. Papist was a big uh, insult that English would use against the various Catholic kingdoms, especially Spanish. So English people... The, the, the 
classes who could read. They were under, by, by the early 1600s, they were under a lot of influence of various propagandists who told them that the Spanish were evil and brutal and that the new world, everywhere the Spanish empire had grown the, in the new world, there were native peoples waiting to be liberated. And so that was some of the original idea behind the English colonial goals, not only to compete economically, but to compete uh, on a moral plane, uh, to prove that their religion was better, to prove that their governmental system was better. And so there were some promoters that were highly influential with the queen in the late 1500s, Queen uh, Elizabeth. And uh, two of them were Richard Hacklett. Uh, they actually, there were actually two Richard Hacklets. Uh, they, they were um, cousins with the same name. And uh, Francis Drake, who was uh, an adventurer, or for lack of a better term, pirate. So... Uh, they were part of a group of colonial promoters that wanted England to compete more directly with the Spanish and Portuguese trade empires. Uh, England was, was poorer than a lot of Europe at the time, and the thinking was they could uh, expand their economy by engaging in new world commerce, but they would do it better. And so in a very a uh, familiar idea, what they argued to the queen, and then uh, similar people argued to King James the uh, first after Elizabeth died in the early 1600s in 1603. They made an argument that to us will sound very familiar. Uh, we'll be greeted as liberators. We will go to the new world we will establish a colony. The natives will see how much better we are than the brutal papists. And they will want the, uh, the gentle government, that was the phrase they used, of Englishmen. The thinking was they would show up, they would establish a, a beachhead or some kind of colony, and then the natives would realize how awesome these, these new people, these new white people were. They would prove that they were not the same kind of white people like the Spanish that brutalized them. And uh, they would just start working for the English and giving them all the goods. And if you look at the, the original documents of the likes of Hacklett, which they, they would present to the English government, royal government, um, it would just have, it would be this, these pages with lists and lists and lists of products that the natives would provide. Uh, basically people like Drake would visit the uh, coastline. They would take note of what plants and things were there uh, and note of what kind of economies the natives had. And they basically said, this is all the stuff they will give to us for free <laughs> or, or close to free. And so it was a very optimistic, uh, kind of delusionally optimistic idea. And uh, there were a couple of attempts in, in North Carolina, the, the Roanoke uh, colonial ventures, which failed. Uh, Francis Drake was involved in that. And uh, Hackley did not go himself. Uh, one of the Queen's uh, favorite uh, kind of quote unquote friends, Walter Raleigh was also involved in, in that. And she didn't let him go, but he was involved in financing these expeditions. And they all failed. And the reason they failed is because the natives were not particularly convinced that, uh, <laughs> that they should just give up their way of life, which was much more efficient than the way English, labor, English economy worked. Uh, the, the English put a lot of focus on working hard, except the people who should work hard are the servants in like the lower orders, the, the more affluent and upper classes, like what these, the, what these people came from, they were not the ones who did the hard work. They were the ones to collect the dividends from the work. So uh, the natives were not interested in becoming subservient to these new colonizers. They didn't really cooperate. And uh, those, those early colonial ventures fell apart in the 1580s and 90s. And they had to evacuate. They came back in 1607. 
Uh, this time placed their colony a little bit further north than uh, originally, or than, than the original design. The thinking was the natives would be a little bit friendlier. There was still this kind of vain and, and uh, naive optimism that the natives would just start working for uh, English colonists. And so the, the kind of English colonists that, that created these colonies, again, they were not uh, they were not a cross section of English society. They were from kind of the aggressive sides of society. Many of them former veterans of the Irish wars, in particular the, the wars of Irish conquest. So they would treat the natives poorly uh, and, and uh, demand a lot from them without giving them much in return. That would create tension with the natives and uh, eventually wars would break out with the natives and then there'd be some kind of truce. Uh, and uh, it was from these initial kind of tensions and conflicts the Pocahontas story came from, for example. And uh, since she was, uh, she was someone who was a broker of, of uh, diplomacy. And... The goal was to make money. They weren't really making money, but the dream was still there for for many for, for a couple decades. Uh, by the 1600s, they had changed tactics and, and turned to private investment to try to provide the the startup capital. And um, the private investors kept being promised, "You're going to get a flood of profit once the natives provide us the the, the good stuff." Uh, but the natives didn't have a lifestyle that really produced uh, an economy of of, uh, of excess. The, the natives produced the goods they needed. They, they didn't produce uh, a, a ton of excess goods to trade uh, for just for the purpose of trading. If, if the natives were going to trade, they traded for what they needed, not just to make uh, profit. They, they didn't have quite the same concept of money. So... That didn't quite work out. Uh, wars and conflicts with the natives really kept that, that labor system from ever taking hold. Um, some of the colonizers attempted to recreate what the Portuguese had done in Africa, which was use some natives as agents to capture other natives for uh, slavery. That worked to some extent in some of the colonies in South Carolina. It worked for a little while, but not for terribly long, as uh, the natives would pretty quickly figure out it was a bad deal. So, but the goal was still naively optimistic. When natives did not work out as labor sources, what they turned to was uh, their own lower classes. So the, 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 some of the arguments for creating colonies were to take pressure off of the problems in English society. England went through something that is also kind of familiar to us. Uh, there were a number of societal changes in the 1500s that uh, made land extremely more expensive. Uh, and the economy kind of stagnated and there was a lot of rise in prices of property, rise in prices of goods. And then there were more people than jobs. And the, the promoters, like Hacula said, you know, a place where we can deal with this, these, these, this excess population is, is the colonies. We can put them to work. They'll work with the natives creating all these goods. And uh, the goal was to use that, that kind of quasi-unfree labor. Uh, to produce the the stuff uh, that that would uh, make England richer and put it in competitive situation with the rest of Europe, that worked for a while. So lately, there's a big a big focus on the year 1619, which is when the first slaves showed up that we have record of in any of the thir what became the 13 colonies, what became the United States. Uh, first slaves showed up in Virginia in 1619. Uh, According to the records, what they called 20 and odd Negroes uh, were sold to the, uh, to the colonists in return for food uh, by a Dutch ship that had been blown off course and needed to uh, uh, resupply its provisions. So some of their cargo were 
some leftovers from whatever slave trading that that ship had been doing, and they sold them to these colonists. Uh, Slavery was somewhat more advanced and organized in the Caribbean and in the Spanish colonies. It was less, it wasn't really organized in Virginia. Uh, the, The Virginia company up to this point only been around about 12, 13 years. They did not have any slave code Uh, or any laws that governed how this labor should be organized. And so what they did with the, with these 20 some people was uh, make them into indentured servants. That was the way that uh, they knew how to organize labor. And that had been the goal of the promoters. uh, And that was kind of the ideal uh, that they were trying to create in this, this colony was this, this more, what they thought of as a more moral, uh, labor system. And so that's what these, these initial black people that were sold in 1619 became. We don't have a uh, record of uh, how many of them survived for that long, but it wasn't that many. And uh, really the labor force in Virginia was largely based on indentured servitude for the next 50 or so years. Uh, even by 1700, the number of slaves in Virginia was uh, relatively low. They were about 12, 15,000 Virginian colonists by 1700, um, less than a thousand of them were slaves. So uh, most of them were servants or, or former servants. So the goal of the company and then the Royal Colony of Virginia after the company fell apart in 1624 was to create kind of an apprenticeship system that would deal with that excess population back in England and kind of put them into a merit system that would make them into useful, productive people. And uh, the way you did that was have them sign an indenture contract. The company and uh, the various promoters would propagandize the the, uh, benefits of this. And... uh, They would entice mostly young English working class people who didn't really have steady jobs and who were crowding the cities and living in slums. And they actually had a name for these people. They were called sturdy beggars, uh, what we would probably call homeless, uh, that uh, were living in uh, living in and off on and off the streets and sometimes working jobs, sometimes not. There weren't enough jobs for them. Uh, A big burgeoning explosion of young people excess of them and the thinking was this is something to do with them and uh, you'd sell them on these indentured contracts that would put them to work in the colonies so thousands of english young people signed up most of them between the ages of about 16 and 26 uh, that signed up for this mostly men about four out of five men some women though about one out of five so uh, thousands of them were sent to virginia in the first 15 20 years And to give you a sense of how bad it was in Virginia, um, the company and then the Royal Colony sent something like 7,000 people in the first 20 or so years of settlement after 1607. And by the 1620s, only about 2,000 to 2,500 were in the population. So there was a very high death rate and also just um, quit rate. If you survived, a lot of times you wanted to get out of there pretty fast. But uh, your chance of making it as a servant in Virginia because of the conditions was about one out of, or about two out of five. Uh, about three out of five of them would die from various diseases and whatnot. The goal of it, you'd sign indenture. This would sign you, bond your labor to a master, whoever paid your indenture. Um, And the way you got an indenture contract is you purchased one from the company or purchased one from the colonial promoters. They cost typically about six pounds. And uh, that generally funded the passage on whatever ship they went on. And then you got their labor for whatever the term, the contract term said, which was, typically five to seven years. So uh, then that labor during that five to seven years was pretty much unfree. And if you looked at it, if we were to go back in time and and view it, it would look just like slavery to us. Uh, The master had pretty much 
complete control over that servant. Uh, they could beat them. They could torture them. They could order them to do pretty much whatever they wanted. Uh, pretty much the only thing you could not do was kill them. So uh, otherwise, that servant was uh, pretty much under your, your complete control if you were master and bought that contract for that seven years. At the end of the seven years, there was supposed to be a reciprocal exchange of uh, land and some goods and some money in exchange for that seven years of labor. And so that was the enticement that caused people to uh, sign up for such a thing. The idea of getting land in England was was unthinkable. But in Virginia, you could become a landowner this way. This worked for about 15 years until people figured out back in England, the conditions are really bad and you weren't going to survive your indenture, most likely. Your chance was less than half of surviving it. So, uh, and if even if you did survive, you'd have been brutalized for those seven years. The masters were not kind to their servants, and they worked them extremely hard, especially once tobacco was discovered to be a lucrative crop. But still, a servitude was seen as preferable to slavery. For one, it was just much cheaper. A slave would cost about 30 pounds. So we're talking... Uh, if, if a Virginia planter that was starting to make money off tobacco needed labor, his choice was servants or slaves. Uh, you could bring over a servant for six pounds each and didn't have to pay anything else after that uh, for the next seven years. And then the, there was a, an incentive to bring more population over and that you'd get a, it was called the head right system, and you'd get 50 acres per head from the company or from the colony for every person you brought over and you paid the six pounds for. Uh, so you're actually incentivized as the master to bring over as many people as possible. And then according to the contracts, the, the free, what were called the freedom dues would uh, come out of your pocket. So whatever acreage you was contracted to the laborer at the end of the seven years that was going to come out of your land but the, the company would give you extra land in order to pay for that in exchange for bringing over the servants but you're incentivized to get as much labor and then land as possible so if you brought over however many servants 20 servants and you got uh three or four hundred extra acres of land as a result of that if you could see to it, your servants died in seven years, or most of them died, suddenly you're a much richer person. So uh, the, the master, the, what were called the grandees, the early successful planters, the ones who, who got the on the ground floor and got the best land, uh, they started engaging in that kind of practice. So servants looked more lucrative than slaves for a pretty long time. The slave cost about 30 pounds each to buy it off the market or buy them off the market coming from the Caribbean, the way the triangular trade worked, the the, the North American coast was the last stop of any slave traders. So that was going to be the highest price for a slave. Uh, and even though you got that person's labor for life, if they weren't going to survive very long, then there's really not much financial benefit to uh, getting a slave for 30 pounds versus getting a servant for six pounds. So most planters employed servants. And a slave code really didn't exist because uh, it didn't need to. So as an example, one of the earlier kind of pioneers of Virginia was a black man named Anthony Johnson. He came within the first 15 years, uh, bought, as a, a, bought from a slave trading ship, but... Again, when he landed in Virginia, there was no legal way to classify what he was. And so he was, was legally classified a servant. He served out his seven years and survived and uh, got his 50 acres uh, as part of his freedom dues. And he established a, a tobacco farm of his own by the 1630s. And he grew his farm. We know he was quite successful because in a couple of different court cases that show up in the Virginia court records in the 1630s, 40s, and 50s, uh, where he, is, he actually won some of his cases against some of his neighbors who tried to claim his land. And there's, there's a quote from him in one, of the, in one of the cases. He says, I know mine own land. And uh, he actually won versus a white neighbor. So here was, was a black man 
came to Virginia as a slave and worked his way out of it. And uh, which most of the servants, if they survived, uh, did kind of w- would kind of work their way at least out of the worst situation. And he was more successful than most by the 1650s. And then at the time of his his death, uh, the records show he had a plantation that was uh, in the 300 acre range, which made him kind of one of the medium sized plantation owners. So uh, definitely on the more successful side of the society. And uh, he owned a number of servants, uh, including some white servants. So, and then he passed on his property to his children. That's when things started to get problematic because the laws began to change in the 1640s and 50s. So it was his, his children had more trouble than uh, white children would have had in Virginia to inherit his property. And they got into more kind of disputes with the Virginia government, and it became so difficult that they decided to move to Maryland uh, as a result of the law, because the laws were getting just more negative towards black people. What, the kind of things that changed were little laws at different times. A big change happened in the 1640s when judges um, in uh, – punishment for runaway servants or in the punishment for running away judges started to uh sentence those runaway servants with lifetime servitude and they tended to do that to the black servants more than the white that was kind of the first change you started to see which happened about 30 40 years after virginia settlement in the 1640s but still it was not universal uh servants could black servants could still make their way into land owning status started to change more again in the 1660s as more slaves started to uh occupy or started to be become uh populated in the colony uh then you start to see more restrictions and it became harder for them to establish themselves as landowners and so johnson's descendants would have realized that that uh, decline in their in their legal status, which is why they moved. The last records we have of his family come from about the 1730s when they were fighting to hold on to their land, uh, when they, they probably lost it. We don't know exactly what happened to his, uh, whoever after his grandchildren. Uh, the last records we have is of his grandson, who was still a landowner in Maryland, but has struggling uh, to win court cases now against people who are claiming his land, saying he doesn't legitimately own it. Uh, we think his kids may have gone to Delaware and New York, but we don't really know. So uh, his life kind of spanned this, this uh, what historians call the terrible transition of servitude turning into racial slavery, the labor force transitioning from servitude to slavery, from that optimistic kind of view of labor to a much more negative coercive uh, system. Not that servitude was nice, but there was a light at that at the end of that tunnel. There were various changes. One of them I mentioned was lifetime servitude. The other was um, classifying slaves according to what they called the condition of the mother and some of the first laws were in the late 1660s that uh, classified the difference between a servant and a slave was the condition of the mother, meaning if the mother was a slave, the child was a slave. That starts to make it more racialized. You can't really break out of it. By the 1670s, 80s, and 90s, uh, you start to see slave codes become a little bit more sophisticated. In 1705, Virginia has more of what we would consider a fully fledged slave code. And people like Anthony Johnson wouldn't be able to exist anymore. A black servant would be classified as slave based on being black. Uh, there were reasons for that. And it kind of goes to the, the origins of racism. So, As far as we can tell from the historical record, race as we think of it today, the hierarchy of what racism is, did not exist prior to about the the 1500s. And we have great examples of it because uh, people like Francis Drake, in order to make money, they would partner with whoever was available. 
And Francis Drake had a famous expedition against the Spanish in which he partnered with the Cimarrons, who were a group of uh, former Spanish slaves who established their own colony in what's now Panama. He brought a bunch of those Cimarrons into his, uh, into his ship's company, and they attacked a bunch of Spanish settlements uh, and looted a bunch of their goods. So, and, and from what we can tell of the records, they had a lot of fun doing it. They, they got along really well. So from what we can tell, there was not uh, racism as we know it. The, again, the prejudice on the part of Europeans would have been based on religion and based on kind of the quality of life uh, that they viewed uh, against foreign people. So there was a uh, rebellion in 1676 that really accelerated the terrible transition called Bacon's Rebellion. And this was a class rebellion. A guy named Nathaniel Bacon, who was a, a lower level aristocrat from England, showed up in Virginia and saw that there was political opportunity among the former servants. The former servants were very conscious of not being treated well. The, the, the system of labor made the rich people richer and made it very hard for the poor and the middle classes to really compete. And uh, to give a sense of how the system, uh, how it benefited the rich, it cost six pounds. And this was, that was a pretty constant price to bring over a servant in most of the 17th century. So you paid six pounds for seven years of labor. Uh, it cost 30 pounds for a lifetime for, for buying a slave, a lifetime of labor. The uh, way the, the Virginia government worked was basically by a, what was called the House of Burgesses, which was a Congress of essentially the rich people. And they, uh, they manipulated the system to benefit themselves. The governor of Virginia uh, created a system in which the profits he made uh, from both taxes and from taking a share of all the tobacco and, and all the other cash crop goods that came out of Virginia made his annual income about a thousand pounds per year. So think about you're a former servant, you cost six pounds uh, for seven years of labor, and maybe you're even if you're a fairly successful tobacco planter, you're maybe making less than 50 pounds a year and spending most of that back into the operation. Uh, that would have been something like a pretty good planter, like Anthony Johnson was making. And uh, here's the governor who's not doing anything but collecting all these dividends from the various products, which includes trade with the natives, which they had cornered that trade for themselves between the rich and the, the native tribes. Uh, they are making a thousand pounds a year. So, and, and using that money to buy more and more and more land to produce more goods and make more money and so forth. So the poorer classes got very angry. They joined Nathaniel Bacon in a rebellion and um, a coalition of former servants and slaves and uh, the poor in Virginia rose up, up against the wealthy class, burned Jamestown to the ground and killed several hundred of their er, several hundred of the colonists and burned a number of their plantations. The colonists had to retreat to the seaboard and wait for reinforcements from England to uh, uh, push the rebellion back. Luckily for them, Bacon died of dysentery about six months into the rebellion. So, uh, and Bacon had a series of demands which uh, sounded very modern. He demanded uh, more equitable taxation. He demanded kind of a distribution of land that was more equitable. He demanded voting rights for all adult males, which included all the adult males in his company, his company which were black and white, uh, and uh, fair ways of access to the ships for tobacco trade that that uh, they wouldn't have to pay taxes to the wealthy landowners and so forth. A, a lot of what we consider pretty modern uh, political innovations was what Bacon's, Bacon and his company demanded in their rebellion, and they almost succeeded. And that was very scary to the planters. And so what the planter class did after Bacon died and they reconsolidated control was uh, 
develop more and more of the slave labor, which uh, made, was easier for them to control because this was foreign labor. Give a sense of how much slave labor increased. Between 1680 and 1750, the estimated proportion of blacks in the Virginia population increased from 7% to 44%, and from 17% to 61% in South Carolina. Uh, to such an extent that a planter named William Byrd in 1776 said, quote, they import so many Negroes hither that I fear this colony will become either confirmed uh, or sometime or other confirmed by the name of New Guinea. In other words, this is becoming an African colony uh, because we're, we're, uh, we're outpopulated now. So the, the increase of slave labor uh, became exponential after after 1676 when this when this rebellion occurred and historians have largely credited it with uh, kind of the the change in thinking among the planters of where their labor should come from so why was it tolerated and why did it become so powerful because english people were pretty big on their freedom uh and during the protestant reformation the uh, 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 english theologian named john uh or John Pone said, England is a body of free men, not a bond men. No king or queen can give and sell them as slaves. Uh, Thomas Hobbes said that uh, for, in order to have freedom, it is necessary for man's life to retain as a right to govern their own bodies, air, water, motion, and ways to go from place to place, and all these things without which a man cannot live. In other words, freedom is control of your own body. That's what they believed. Um, in the 18th century, King George III, the people who the revolutionaries said uh, was a uh, tyrant and an enslaver, said that the pride and glory of Britain and the direct end of its constitution is liberty. So how did slavery become more powerful in that context? Uh, this was basically a genesis of what we call white supremacy. Um, the class solidarity went away in Virginia after the after Bacon's Rebellion. And the planters started focusing more on propagandizing to the lower classes. You are better than them. Uh, and there are, these are the reasons why. Maybe you don't today, and maybe you won't tomorrow, but someday you can own some property and pass that on to your children. Someday you can get married and have families. Someday you can associate freely and travel freely. Uh, someday you can serve on juries and vote. Someday uh, you'll, you'll be able to do all these things and be able to work your way up. Slaves can't do any of those things. So this is a way to, uh, yeah, to create a racial solidarity versus that class solidarity that was threatening. So slavery uh, grew as the economy grew throughout the 18th century. Uh, it became more and more powerful, more and more integral to the economy, uh, and it accelerated with the triangular trade, which made America rich. Uh, by the time of the American Revolution, England is making a ton of money off this so-called triangular trade, in which the slave labor from Africa was fueling the raw material production, which was then uh, fueling the industrial production back in England, which was all self-reinforcing and making the people who were able to control those that the, the different points of that trade, all of them very, very rich. To an extent, they became enslaved by the system. You, you became trapped in the system and couldn't get out of it. Uh, even the people who did the enslaving were kind of enslaved by the system itself. Obviously, they knew how bad it was what they were doing. They could see it every day. So the people who worked on the slave ships, for example, they were in a way slaves themselves. Uh, the, who would be the, the, the actual slave traders? Um, English companies and moneyed interests would hire a manager, a uh, ship's captain, and he would hire a crew. A lot of that crew was conscripted from the uh, jails. Uh, you, so you'd go to the jails in England, you'd conscript a lot of those men, uh, 30 of them or whatever, and uh, you'd say, you're now the crew on my ship. And when you complete your term of service, your uh uh, your, your, your jail time will be done. So you have to serve here. And if you don't, you're going to go back to jail and your jail and your sentence is going to be extended. 
So that's your choice. And the ship's captains were, were under the pay of, uh, uh, of these various companies. And they were also kind of invested themselves uh, in acquiring uh, the, the best, most profitable product available. And uh, the, even some of them wrote about how they felt trapped by the system. One was a slave, French slave trader named Jarn uh, Barbeau uh, in the 18th century. And he talked about how, you know, money is the god of mankind. I can't fight this. Uh, we spend the best time of our lives in, in Africa among Negroes scraping for money. This is what we have to do. And, and it was just kind of, he, he, he felt trapped by the system as well, but also was an agent of extreme brutality. Uh, the, the conditions were terrible, obviously on these ships, uh, so bad that some of the slaves would try to kill themselves. And a lot of the job was of the crew was to try to keep the suicides to a minimum uh, because the conditions were so bad and all these, there would maybe be 30 to 40 crew members that had to control about 300 uh, captives, uh, captive slaves, people about to become slaves. And um, the only way you could do that was by an extreme system of fear. And so the whole thing kind of self-reinforced, uh, and then they would sell this, the, sell the human product in the Caribbean, sell some of the what was left in in the thirteen colonies, and uh, the system would would uh, spiral up from there. Uh, by the time of the American Revolution, there was a compromise with this system because it was so powerful. Uh, it was the bedrock of the economy of most of the 13 colonies, what were establishing themselves as the United States by 1776 to 83. And so the, the people who, the political leaders that, that, that politically founded the country, um, they understood that this was a system they had to tolerate. They did not, and they kind of took an opinion or took an attitude of, we know this is a problem and we hope it will resolve someday. They were very aware of the brutality of it. Uh, George Washington himself said in, in one of his documents that uh, the, the way we rule Negroes is with extraordinary and arbitrary sway. Uh, so they very much understood what they were doing and they also understood why. And so they compromised with the system in order to keep they did what politicians do and they compromised in order to get something done. And the something was to unite the 13 colonies in opposition to Britain to declare independence. They couldn't get all 13 without some compromise with the slave interest, which was actually most of the colonies basically from Delaware South. Uh, it eventually started to uh, decline uh, North of Virginia. But they made this compromise, and they kind of hoped the system would just resolve. A lot of the, uh, the so-called founding fathers believed that technology would resolve the slavery issue, that eventually technology would get better, and they wouldn't need so many slaves, and you'd eventually send the currently enslaved people back to Africa. That was kind of the thought that a lot of them had. Uh, some of them, of course, were deeply embedded in the slave system, made so much money on it, they wanted to expand it. And there were a few. John Jay would have been one of them. Uh, you didn't like slavery and wanted to somehow phase it out. But those people were, were in the minority, although they did exist. What they did not predict was how powerful cotton would become. And the way I characterize it with students is like cotton is kind of like oil. It's in everything. Look at what we're wearing. Uh, it's in your coffee filters. It's it's in your uh, uh, it's in pretty much every fabric you wear. It's it's in all kinds of products. It's still an extremely important product, and at this time it was even more so. It was integral to the economy, and then it became much more efficient with the cotton gin, and um, it, and that just increased the slave labor to the point where cotton was so important by the. Uh, mid 19th century to the American economy that the idea of getting rid of it was unthinkable. And the way cotton was produced for the world market was by slavery. And so the slaves and the cotton 
were intertwined. You could not separate them. And uh, it, 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 James Henry Hammond gave a famous speech in, in the 1850s called the, the King Cotton speech, in which he said, you cannot make war against cotton because cotton is king. And he meant king of the economy, which it was kind of true. At that point, what we think of as racism became more salient. Uh, Southern defenders of slavery started using more and more what we would recognize as racist arguments to defend slavery. The racism, racism became much more clear and more modern. Uh, the argument that slavery was just something to be tolerated went away, and the argument started to rise in the South that slavery was something that was good for Black people, that they were meant to be slaves, and this was good for them. Uh, and you start to see kind of pro-slave propaganda that usually showed the slaves being happy and uh, that they wouldn't be happy being free. And a lot of criticism of abolitionism, which was growing by the, the, the mid-19th century. In reality, slavery was brutal. And I, I won't, don't have time to go into the detail of how brutal it was, but it was brutal because of the system. And uh, there's, there's two ways I'll illustrate this. One is the value of it, and two is the way it could manifest. So the value of slavery was unbelievable. Uh, approximately, because of its connection to cotton, it was part of a worldwide economic network that was a huge industry, approximately equivalent today if you were to do the net worth of everything that slaves produced uh, and what, how that value was added, it would add up to approximately $11 trillion today. The, that would be approximately the valuation today of the global pharmaceutical industry. That's, that's how powerful it was, not just the slaves themselves, but everything related to the capital that, was, uh, that, that they were at the base of producing. Uh, the slaves themselves were worth a lot. By the 19th century, an average slave sold in general for about $400 US dollars. In the South, keep in mind that per capita annual income in 1850 was approximately $150,000, or excuse me, $150. People like doctors and lawyers made about $1,500. And so an average slave, not a particularly useful one, was about $400. A prime field hand would sell for about $800. That's the equivalent today of around $70,000, $90,000 per slave. That's just to purchase one, not talking about what they produced. Based on planter records, what we can estimate is that the average return on investment of purchasing a slave, if you purchased a $400 to $800 slave, that slave over their lifetime returned for you, the buyer, approximately 10% return on investment per year. So if that were a stock, you'd be pretty rich pretty quick, especially the more slaves you accumulate. And uh, especially if you get them creating the, the, uh, uh, the profitable products. So uh, in our term, in proportional terms, in 1860, a prime field hand bought at around age 20 for $1,000 could be expected to produce about $120,000 worth of value in his lifetime. Uh, in our money, that would be like investing $100,000, and by the end of the investment, producing about $2.5 million. So, uh, and there were approximately 3.5 million slaves by, by 1860. So, uh, not only that, but the social capital was also important. Uh, having slaves was something that was a point of pride for Southerners white southerners the brutality of the system and i don't have time to go too much into it so I'll, I'll keep this brief by explaining how why people would do this and why they would tolerate the um the moral turpitude of it if you were a white person invested in the slave system i have students a lot of times ask me why would anyone do this to other humans and what i try to explain to him is imagine the power over those human beings that that slave owner has not only is it just this financial value 
that's we have financial stocks. You, you, we, we have uh, investments you can invest in today, but that they don't give you the same kind of power. They also give you social capital. Every slave you had was a product of social capital that every extra one you had made you a bigger shot in the society that was connected to what slaves produced. Um, slave owners kind of looked at themselves like these, like, like these lords of their manors uh, and considered themselves kind of the natural leaders and your power of these humans was was uh, unbelievable. And you could do what you wanted with them. And you thought it was right that you did that. So uh, it was an intoxicating system to be a part of if you were on the benef- if you were one of the beneficiaries. The the power is kind of unimaginable to us now because we don't have this kind of ability to control other humans this way but it was about as close as you could get to being like a prince and a lot of the 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 slave owners actually did look at their estates as like these kingdoms over which these people were their subjects so uh as an example of the how brutal the system could be though, because it was a system and it didn't matter how nice the masters were. A lot of them were nice people, but it didn't matter how nice they were because of the system. Um, in 1850, a 14 year old slave named Celia was purchased by a Missouri farmer named Robert Newsom. He was a respected farmer. He had six other slaves, all of them men. Uh, this was his seventh slave. His, li- his, his wife had recently died, and he had, but he had two daughters. And he told his daughters that he was purchasing this new slave, a 14-year-old girl, to be a domestic servant for him, to do his cooking and his cleaning and his whatnot. But what she really was going to be was his sex slave. And uh, right after he purchased her, he raped her on the way back to his farm. He treated her like his mistress for the next five years, built her her own slave quarter so they could have their private times. Uh, And uh, between the ages of 14 and 19, she gave birth to two children as a result of that uh, ongoing abuse and rape. When she was 19, she fell in love with another slave on a neighboring farm. And this, her, her boyfriend wanted her to stop seeing uh, the, the slave, the, the master, Robert, uh, this is something she didn't really have the power to do. She tried to tell Robert she didn't want to engage in sexual activity with him anymore, but he wasn't going to listen to that. I mean, she's a slave. She has to do what he says. Uh, so in June of 1855, they had had increasing arguments to her and her master and Newsom went to Celia's cabin. He made advances on her like he usually did. And she protested. Uh, and what happened was they got into a fight and she hit him with a, a tree branch and killed him. Uh, there was an investigation of the murder by the police. This, this was by the 1850s where abolitionists had, had uh, become prominent. And so some abolitionist lawyers picked up on this case and they wanted to try to make a point. And the judge that picked up on the case also wanted to make a point. Uh, her lawyer tried to argue that the right of women in Missouri to defend themselves against sexual assault assault was uh, also her right as a female and that she should be, uh, there should be a not guilty verdict for murder because she was defending herself. And according to Missouri law, women had the right to use deadly force to defend themselves against rape. Uh, Celia, though, could not testify on her own behalf because she was a slave. And so we couldn't get what her side of the story was. All we could get were the uh, prosecution's witnesses of uh, News- who were all Newsom's friends. So there was no way to prove that Newsom was trying to rape her. And then the judge ruled that in any case, it wouldn't have mattered if they could. Uh, because the defense was illegitimate. Legally speaking, a white person could not possibly rape a slave is what the judge ruled. Slaves were property. Raping a slave was at worst trespassing on someone else's property. 
if you were if you raped someone else's slave. You could not trespass against your own property. And so there was no such thing as rape of your own slave. Uh, Celia was found guilty of murder, and she was hanged in December of 1855 uh, when uh, she was 21 years old. So this is an example of how even... Even if you try to look to, if you tried to look at slavery in the best light possible, this kind of thing was was uh, thinkable, and it was what the system allowed and even encouraged. The abolitionists who picked who funded her legal defense, I mean, they wanted to make a point about this, and that's why they did it. And so, abolitionists kind of won the uh, the moral argument here, and they were winning by the eighteen sixties. Uh, racists tried to fight back in different ways to argue that no, they were wrong, and what we know of as racism kind of developed as a result of that fighting back, which is kind of a continuation of the old pro-slavery arguments that continued after slavery of why the races were different and needed to be separated. Racism then became scientific, and there were various backlashes to any kind of racial progress. Backlash to Reconstruction, or backlash to the Civil War and Reconstruction was uh, was Jim Crow and scientific racism. Backlash against civil rights were things like the Ku Klux Klan and um, white nationalism in the 20th century. Uh, and then we have kind of, if you've ever heard of critical race theory, this is a new version of the backlash. Uh, there's there's a theory that that uh, that every time there's a civil rights progression forward there's a step back uh when the backlash occurs and this occurs again and again in history we've seen it again and again um we see it from the very beginning when i when i illustrated that anthony johnson example of when people like that make some racial progress there's a push back against it so it really goes back to the colonial times this pattern of racial progress and then uh a step back and uh, this, this happens again and again. The, and the whole critical race theory really today is, is really part of it. So uh, that is kind of a brief uh, overview of the arc of slavery. That doesn't even do it justice. But uh, if you're interested, the library has a lot of these books where you can read more about it. Um, it's it really a quite... Uh, it's, I find the whole critical race theory stuff really fascinating because it's, it's stuff that's been, the history of slavery has been studied considerably in American history. And actually the history is the source of what became the legal theory, critical race theory in the 1980s. Some of the, the, the books that did the original history of some of the tropes I just talked about, the narratives I just talked about, those are the sources that the critical theorists used. So historians have known about this for a long time, and we've been um, uh, we've been exploring the relationship of slavery to the societal institutional system ever since about the World War II period, especially since the civil rights period. But uh, lately, it's it, it, it's both good and bad in that it's made historians more relevant, but also put them on the defense a little bit. You know, suddenly the things they've been saying for about thirty or forty years are suddenly now kind of controversial, which is interesting. So I recommend any of these books if 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 you want. But thank you, and uh, I guess we'll we'll take some questions. Yeah, interesting. Um, Murray, will you stop sharing your screen? Yeah. So um, also, I would love to get that list of books and we can put together a, um, a bibliography of those books. I'm pretty sure, 100% sure that the majority of those are in our collection. Yeah. Um, so I was writing down some questions and I, I don't see any coming in through the chat or the Q&A, but if you have some questions, please um, put those in there. I was really curious when you were talking about uh, perhaps some of our founding fathers hoping that the institution of slavery would resolve because of technology um, improvements when really technology brought about the cotton gin, which brought about yeah. more. I, it's super interesting that they were hoping for some resolution um, from technology and really just made it worse. Yeah. Well, they were just, they had kind of this, it's interesting now, it, uh, they had a lot of the same arguments that we have now. Uh, 
uh, as, when I hear the arguments about the labor shortage now, it's actually quite similar to the arguments they made then about why we need slavery. Uh, and because uh, they're like, well, no one wants to work. So where are we going to find the workers? Uh, this is a place we can find them. And these people are the ones meant to work, to do this kind of work. And uh, who else is going to do it? And so we, they had these same kind of arguments really all through the late 17th and 18th centuries. Um, we, we kind of look, we kind of try to, we think of it as, you know, slavery was this evil package that just showed up and suddenly it, you know, the, the evil package that, that could cause the kind of abuse that happened to Celia just was like that. But no, it, it developed over hundreds of years. And so the, the founding father generation, they were very aware of the, the, the paradox of how they were talking about liberty when they had slavery as an integral part of their economy. Yeah, and, and as part of their own personal economy, right? Right, and, and, and they were aware of that. Thomas Jefferson yeah. was probably one of the most open in writing about it, and he wanted to try to blame someone else. He put that part in the Declaration of Independence, try to blame the King of England because he wanted to try to say someone else's fault, not ours, that this has been going on 150 years. Um, but And they, they knew it was a problem because they had the same arguments we do about race, uh, they worded it in different ways, but uh, the, the, where you saw kind of what we would call today the progressive argument was mostly from certain religious interests. Um, Quakers in particular made a lot of what was kind of similar to progressive arguments today over races should about how races should be equal and we should, you know, we need to pay people back for the abuse they've endured and, and things like that. And um, they made those kinds of arguments and the people who were trying to forge this country were like, we don't have time for that. We've got a country we're trying to build. And if we do what you're saying, uh, the country will fall apart. So, and, and we'll all uh, go back to being British again. So what do you want? Uh, we're going to do the best we can here. And they did try to outlaw the slave trade uh, or the importation of slaves, uh, but with the thinking that that would actually hurt the system or make it less profitable, but that actually made it more profitable. Right. And that, that was super, as I was listening to you um, talk about the economics of slavery, it was, it was really uncomfortable for me to um, have to listen to people be reduced to, or yeah, to be, qualified as and quantified as money. Yeah. It's really hard to listen to. Um and also very interesting. It was it was a market just like stocks. Yeah. And uh you could speculate in like slave futures. Um you could speculate in the actual product themselves like you would gold or silver. You could purchase slaves and then kind of hold them or rent them out. Uh, there were all kinds of ways you could make money off of it. There were some people who specialized in that. Uh, Frederick Douglass was a good example of someone who was able to escape slavery because he was eventually owned by someone who rented him out. And uh, he was able to create that separation and able to get away a little bit easier because he wasn't controlled all the time. Uh, and so uh, he, he had easier access to running away as a result of that uh, of that relationship he had with one of his slave masters and uh, so it, uh, it it was a it, it permeated all through the system and the finance was really inextricable from it and people just kind of it was kind of like now like people just if we talk about climate change or whatever or any kind of problem is this hard people just didn't want to think about it and you confront them with it, and the religious kind of the, the religious fundamentalists would confront them with the morality, and they were just like, "I, what do you want me to do? Uh, nothing we can do. Sorry. Yeah. Maybe it'll get better." Yeah, and that's you know I think that's what's really interesting about 
our heritage, our American, the founding of our country. And personally, me learning to hold these two things at the same time, like Thomas Jefferson writing some of the most beautiful words about liberty and freedom, um, also own slaves. You know, that, that yeah. we, it's complicated. He struggled with it himself. He wrote a lot about it. And uh, he actually talked about, because racism was a little bit different then than what it became when slavery became, was even bigger business. And so Jefferson wasn't racist in the same way as racist would be racist 50 years after he died. Um, because he, he, he was also in love with a slave woman, Sally Hemings. I mean, she was related to his wife. She looked like his wife just a little bit darker shade. And uh, from all we can gather, he was kind of obsessed with her. And, uh, you know, he, he thought about that a lot. And he, he actually talked about it in some of his writings. He's like, you know, that I actually think the Africans have bigger hearts than white people, uh, but they're in this position and that's kind of where they're meant to be. And what can we do? <laughs> like, that yeah, was- it's, it's super, well... I just, uh, so also my last question, I wanted to, to ask about Celia's story. How did that come to light, that story? And um... It's a pretty high profile case. It was kind of like, you know, George Floyd or something. Um, it was a high profile case for both pro-slavery advocates, people. And so abolitionists were kind of like the, um, they were the flamethrowers of their time and they were growing political movement. They went from like 2% of Northern opinion to 5% to 10% by the 1850s. And they were very vocal and they wanted, they used a, a method they called moral suasion. And they thought, you know, what we need to focus on is just the blatant evil of slavery, the, the ungodliness brutality of it, which was uh, something that some of the priests back in like hundreds of years before had, had the same uh, campaigns they had tried to do against slavery. Uh, the abolitionists were very religiously motivated as well. And they were part of kind of a religious, a lot of them were part of the religious movements going on at the time. So they were motivated and uh, they wanted to make an example out of this case. Cause they were like, this is exactly what we've been saying. The system's brutal. The Southerners have been saying things like slavery is not that bad. Uh, black people like being slaves. Uh, they'd be worse off if they were in Africa and, and things like that. And, and so the abolitionists were like, no, and here's an example. And so they, they made it a high profile case. The judge of the case also wanted to prove them wrong because a lot of sub- white Southerners found the abolitionists found their, their existence of their opinion, just abominably vulgar. And they wanted to prove them wrong with a passion. And so the judge wanted to not only that wanted to make an example of them. They wanted to make an example of Celia's case. And so that kind of clashed and it became this uh, uh, kind of public relations uh, viral moment in a way. Interesting. Um, okay, so we do have a question and I don't know if, if um, I'm going to ask it. And I don't know if um, you have any suggestions or any so the question comes from laura and she wants to know what are your recommendations for how we handle racism now oh god (laughs) i know that might be a whole nother program a whole nother presenter yeah Uh, you know there's a lot of resources out there um the the gen under the general theme of anti-racism and I think kind of taking the the cue from the abolitionists, what the abolitionists did differently than the other than some of their older critics of racism was not uh, give in to the passive toleration and kind of give in to the uh, despair of the strength of the system. Uh, the abolitionists said, you know, what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong, and uh, we're going to. Uh, uh, we're going to drive that train. And they were willing to make things very uncomfortable. They were willing to put their lives on the line in some cases, because uh, there'd be mobs who would try to attack them for saying controversial things. Uh, like black people should be equal with white people. Like that, that was that was a controversial thing and they would sometimes get attacked. Uh, and, and so I think it kind of takes that activist class to be willing to put their... Uh, uh, sometimes to put their safety on the line 
and definitely put their reputation on the line uh, to to kind of fight back. Because if you don't really fight back, you become, like I said in the toward the beginning, enslaved by the system itself. You just you you, you acquiesce to it, and it's so powerful that you just kind of give in to it. And um, because you make the argument, well, I'm not directly responsible. Why blame me? Uh, but you are kind of passively letting it happen. And so the abolitionists were like the anti-racists of their time. They're like, I'm going to be completely against this. I'm going to call it out wherever I see it. I'm going to call out you people as morally wrong. I don't care if you like it or not. And But some of them suffered from that. Uh, and uh, during the civil rights era, same kind of thing happened. Uh, people had to put their lives on the line. So uh, that's kind of what I, what I would recommend is you kind of look into the, if you really want to push back on racism, it's, it's, you know, you have to create the, the wave that uh, pushes back against it and not just let that tide come in and just float with it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Otherwise this has gone a little bit long. Ray, awesome job. <laughs> Um, Murray, I love always getting that backstory on things that we think we know stuff about. Um, Someday I'll get it within an hour. I always say I'm going to. <laughs> and it always comes in closer to an hour and 20. <laughs> but I, I appreciate your passion and really helping us understand, you know, the roots of this stuff that we are, you know, that we're dealing with now. Um, we continue to muddle through and that what hold it what did you call that that time of transition what was it called the terrible transition the terrible transition yes super interesting i'd never heard that term before and I, you know that that shift was obviously um really i don't want to say dramatic important in leading us to where yeah you know getting through the the racism stuff that we're dealing with now so Super interesting. Um, okay, so everybody who was on the call tonight, um, let's see, we did get one little thank you from Laura. Thank you, Laura. Uh, everybody who is here tonight is going to get a, a an evaluation to fill out. And I want to thank Ray. And I want to thank Murray. This was a, a, a lovely way to spend the Tuesday after Martin Luther King Day to try to understand some of the and Thank I'm, you, Ray, for interpreting that whole time. <laughs> That's long. <laughs> that was long. 